Good morning, everyone. Warm welcome to you all, to those worshipping with us here in the church, in the overflow, in the hall, and those watching online. You're all very welcome as we worship God together today. Please remember the usual social distancing. Masks uh, must be worn during your time on the premises. Just a few notices this afternoon. Uh, the Faith Mission are having their annual, somewhat late, rally as a drive-in at Pigeon Town, the home of the Hydes down there near Glenavy. Everyone is very welcome. That's at half past three. It's a drive-in. Stay in your car. Congregational committee meeting will take place this Tuesday evening, the 8th of June, at 8 p.m. in the church hall. It will be an in-person meeting with appropriate social distancing and face coverings. Next Sunday morning, we look forward to having the members of SALT sharing with us. Now, because of the restrictions, they won't be able to do it in the usual way, but they have all recorded little bits to take part in the service, and we will see them on the screens. <clears throat> so that will be next Sunday morning at the usual time. Thanks to some of the choir members for leading us in our worship today. We give thanks to you, O Lord our God, the one who was and is and is to come, because you have taken your power and reign. As we come into God's presence, we sing together, remaining seated, be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Let's join together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, what a privilege it is for us to come into your presence 
and know that you are here with us, not that you are ever far away from us, for you are here, you are everywhere. You are the same God yesterday, today, and forever. You never change. But we thank you whenever your people gather together in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, you come by the power of your Holy Spirit to bless us. So enable our worship today, we pray. As we confess our sins, forgive. As we hear your word, may it speak to our hearts and lives. And as we go from this place, may your spirit go with us, that we live to your glory and to your praise as living, vibrant witnesses for Jesus Christ, our Lord. God, our Father, abide in your presence, your awesome holiness. We are all too aware of our own faults and our failings. We know that we have sinned against you in thought and word and deed, in what we've done and what we've left undone. We know there is no goodness, no righteousness that we can claim. But we come humbly, turning from our sin and asking that in your mercy you will forgive, knowing that you are a loving, forgiving, and a merciful God who has sent his Son to be our Saviour and the Saviour of the world. And so it's in his name that we ask that you will forgive. And Lord, as you cleanse us, also renew us, equip us, and empower us to be the people that you want us to be. Lord, accept our worship our praise and our prayer as we offer all now in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Boys and girls, I'm sure you all like to take photographs. Very, very easy these days. Uh, with your mobile phones, all you do is find the right button. I need to turn it on first, don't you? That would help, wouldn't it? And there we are. And, oh, the thumbs in the way. Still in the way. How am I? Very easy nowadays. There you are. Got a photograph to see who was here today. Very easy to take a photograph with your uh, <coughs> mobile phone these days. Wasn't always so simple. Just this week, I, I came across uh, my father's old camera, still in its original box. And in those days, of course, and get it out. It wasn't quite so simple. I reckon my father bought this in the 1930s and you had to, well first of all you had to open it all up and you had to put a roll of film into it and you had to then get the wee bit and wind it on and then you had to pull it out into place and then you had to adjust the various settings on the side of it here uh, and then you had to, some, there's no film in this, anyway, but you had to look down into it tiny, tiny little thing here and go, and that took the photograph. But that wasn't just it then, of course. You had to take it to the chemist shop when the film was all finished. Well, you wound it out of the thing and you took the little film into the chemist shop. They sent it away for processing. And up to a week later, your prints came back and they looked something like this. I think I have some of them on the Oh, sorry, I forgot to put that on. That's the better picture of it there for you. That's what they looked like, and that's the size they were, black and white. And yes, fortunately, they're fairly small, and you can't see, but it's me in the bottom too. Those photographs were actually taken with this little camera. Mobile phones, of course, nowadays are great for photos. They do all the complicated things for you automatically. Uh, and it even puts the light on, which I didn't intend to do. Anyway. I don't often use it, actually. I still prefer to use a proper camera. Stop it, would you? <laughs> they do all the complicated things. Of course, it's important that you focus on the right thing. With all the special things, you can take selfies and you can take wide-angle ones and you can take all sorts of photos. But it's important if you want to take a photo that you don't focus on yourself or you don't get the camera the wrong way around. Getting the focus right is the most important thing. Focusing on the thing that you want to take a picture of. <clears throat> in our daily life, boys and girls, it's also important that we focus on the right things too. Sometimes we forget what is the most important thing and we focus on ourselves. Our Bible lesson today 
which we're going to look at in a moment. We're going to read the passage in a moment or two, and then there's some worksheets for you in the boxes or online. It's the story of Jesus going to visit some of his friends in Bethany, two sisters in particular, Martha and Mary. They welcomed Jesus into their home, and Martha immediately began to work very hard, getting all the dinner ready, getting all things ready for Jesus so they could have a meal with them. But Mary, she just sat down at Jesus' feet and listened to him talking and teaching her. Martha was upset with her sister that she wasn't helping her. So she went to Jesus and complained, Can't you see my sister's not helping me? Don't you even care? Tell her to help me. She said. Jesus answered, Martha, Martha, you're all worried and troubled and upset about many things. Only a few things are important. Maybe just one. Mary has chosen the most important thing. And they'll not take it away from her. Listening to Jesus, hearing what he had to say. Martha made the mistake of focusing on herself and other things rather than focusing on Jesus. He wasn't worried about having a meal. Mary, on the other hand, was totally focused on Jesus, the right thing. And that's what we should do in our lives. Focus on Jesus. All the other things, yes, they have their important place, of course. But focusing on Jesus will help put everything into perspective. He's the one thing that's really important. Our children's song this morning is one we can all join in, but it's, it's on the screens, it's on, on an MP4. It's called Every Move I Make. Now we're going to read together from God's Word, 
Today we're reading from Luke chapter 10 and verses 38 to 42. Let's hear God's word. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. We thank God for his word. Before we consider this little story, we're going to sing together the hymn, Jesus, the very thought of you. Fatigue is one of the most common complaints these days. Too many people are juggling multiple responsibilities, getting too little sleep and not enough exercise. A recent study has shown that between 10 and 20% of all crashes in the UK 
are caused by driver fatigue. Other studies have shown similar figures for workplace accidents and industry, industrial accidents. The German philosopher uh, Bayung Chul Han, probably haven't written anything by him, I must admit I haven't either, but I've read an article about his book that he's written recently called The, the Fatigue Society or The Burnout Society. Interestingly, he suggests that the reason why we so often feel exhausted and fatigued is because we are surrounded by a culture of positivity. He says that things like the, the Nike slogan, just do it, sound like an empowering slogan, indicating our freedom, our, our limitless possibilities and potential. But according to Han, this is an illusory freedom. The message enclosed within just do it, he says, is you should do it. And there's that pressure to do it, to do everything. Writing from a secular perspective, of course, Hans says that instead of living in a disciplinary society regulated by social norms, prohibitions and commandments, the word he actually uses, we now live in an achievement society in which we voluntarily succumb to the pressure of achieving and always striving to try, try, try and do more. The Bible is in agreement with him. In today's reading from Luke, Jesus met a frazzled woman and talked to her about her condition. Martha, she lived in the town of Bethany, just outside Jerusalem, hard-working, practical, caring woman that she was, but she had problems, several, several of which affect us so often. Because when we're like Martha, we're distracted. Verse 39, 40 says, Martha was distracted with much serving. The Greek word is a compound word to draw and the word around or away. It's the idea of being pulled in every direction. Martha was pulled in lots of different directions. And most of us can identify with that. We allow ourselves to become too busy, busier than God would intend us to be, busier than is really necessary, busier than is wise. We're distracted and fatigued. When we're like Martha, we're doubting. Verse 40, Martha has said something shocking. Lord, do you not care? How often when we're being pulled in all directions, do we momentarily doubt God cares that his concern for us? When we're like Martha, we're self-pitying. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work? Of course, Martha did need help. No one denies that. Many hands make light work. The running of a household and certainly the entertaining of guests require that other members of the family do their part. But Martha's agenda didn't line up with Jesus' agenda. He wasn't so concerned about the seasoning in the beans or how much dust there was on the floor or whether the napkins were folded in the correct way. He was concerned that his life-changing word and message got out and that those in the house heard what he had to say. That left Martha feeling abandoned in the kitchen where she felt out of it in a grudging mood of irritable self-pity. How often have we found ourselves in that situation, I wonder? When we're like Martha, we're worrying Martha, Martha, Jesus said, you're worried. Someone has said, worry is a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind until it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. Let's repeat that. I think it's a very good quote. Worry is a small trickle of fear that meanders through the mind until it cuts a channel into which all other thoughts are drained. 
We are a worried people, a worried society. And of course, the last year and everything that has happened has given us extra reason to worry. When we're like Martha, we're troubled. Jesus used the word trouble to describe Martha in verse 42. The NIV says you are upset about many things. Troubled is another way of putting it. I feel the many things included more than just the preparations for that meal. Maybe there are many other burdens that Martha had that we don't know about. And maybe many of us gathered here this morning have worries and troubles that nobody else knows about. No wonder we can identify with Martha. Pulled in all directions, questioning even God's power and goodness, sinking into self-pity, worried and upset about many things. What should we be? More like Mary, of course. When we're like Mary, Jesus' prescription was a little dose of Maryness, somebody has written. One thing is needed, and Mary has chosen the good part, Jesus said. She was sitting at his feet, listening to his every word. That implies three things. Submission, at his feet. Sixteen times we get that phrase in the Bible. Implying an attitude of submission and trust. So you can imagine in the picture there, her sitting at his feet, drinking in every word that he said. Mary could have sat next to him. But she had a trusting, submissive heart expressed by being at his feet. Isn't that the place that we need to be? At Jesus' feet. Submitting ourselves to him, of course, as Lord of our lives. When he forgives our sin and we trust in him. Sitting at his feet. Listening to his word through his written word to us through our minds. We need to be more submissive, trusting. When we're like Mary, it implies devotion. There's a similar scene in John 12, where this same Mary is at a dinner party, and once again sitting at Jesus' feet, washing his feet with perfume, wiping them with her hair. Devotion giving herself and giving her all to Jesus. That's also the antidote to the ways of this world, to the pressures of the just do it, you should do it generation. Giving our devotion to Jesus. And communion, Mary was listening to his word. She was having a quiet time, her Bible study, if you like. She was in prayer. Best way to be fresh and refreshing to others is to learn to sit at the feet of Jesus with an open Bible and an open heart and an open mind, meeting him so that he can give us a word. We need to be more like Mary, sitting at the feet of Jesus. Of course, if Martha was distracted, if, if Jesus were coming to your house, you'd be distracted too. Stories told that when he was president of the United States of America, Jimmy Carter, in his travels around various parts of the states, would sometimes stay in someone's private home. He said that spending the night with a typical American family helped him stay in touch with what was really happening in the nation. He would sit in their living room and talk with them till late on in the evening and sleep in their guest room. Being the president of America, of course, it was always a bit of a circus with hundreds of reporters and secret service agents all over the place. But yet, it was good things, and it was a good public relations idea. If the president or the queen or someone important was coming to spend the night with us, we'd be a nervous wreck trying to get everything ready for them. But what if the most important, the most famous, and the most admired man in the history of the human race were coming to you? Jesus. Yes, so often we're like Martha. We identify with her. Can we learn from her to avoid the sin of busyness? The great lesson of this story is that being occupied with Christ is more important even than being occupied for Christ. It's certainly better 
and preoccupied with self. Let's pray. Lord, God of stillness and silence, you are the God of peace and quiet. You have told us to be still and know that you are God. We recall the words of Jesus to his disciples to come apart for a while and rest. But we confess our busyness, our barrenness, and our frantic coming and going. Teach us, Lord, to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that everything else we need will then be added onto it. Lord, calm our souls. Teach us the perfect peace of your green pastures and still waters. Lord, hear our prayers as we offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we finish our service today, uh, I have a very unusual uh, and different and delightful thing that uh, we're going to do. You probably know that our friends Andy and Eileen uh, were married back in February, I think it was, uh, in a civil ceremony because of all the restrictions and things that got at the time. They didn't have a chance really to do anything else. So they're going to come to the front today here and uh, seek God's blessing upon their marriage. So I invite Andy and Eileen to come up. And in Ireland, we rejoice in your marriage, and we are happy now to ask God to bless it. You have been married according to the law of the land. You have pledged your love and loyalty to each other, and now in faith you are coming before God and his people to acknowledge your covenant of marriage. In Christian marriage, a man and a woman bind themselves to each other in love and become one with Christ in his church. Let us pray. Loving God, without your grace, no promise is sure. So strengthen Andy and Eileen by the gift of your Holy Spirit as they come to seek your blessing upon their marriage. May they keep the vows they make and be faithful to each other and to you. Fill them with your joy, we pray. Guide them by your word that they may follow you all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Andy. You have taken Eileen to be your wife. Do you promise with God's help to be her faithful husband and to love her as Christ commands, to comfort and protect her and honour her as long as you both shall live? And Eileen, you have already taken Andy to be your husband. Do you promise now with God's help to be his faithful wife and love him as Christ commands, to comfort and protect him and to honour him as long as you both shall live? May the rings which you wear be symbols of unending love and faithfulness. May they remind you of the covenant into which you have entered. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up the light of his face upon you and shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace, both now and evermore. Amen. Mr. and Mrs. Forshaw. First time I've had the chance to say that, and it sounds good. On behalf of all your friends here in Lone Ends, may I congratulate you again, not only on your official marriage back in February, but on your coming today to reaffirm your vows in front of God and his people gathered here today. And it is our prayer that you will know God's richest blessing in the future. We're going to close our service now singing our final hymn, uh, which if I could remember what it is, it's All I Once Held Dear, uh, which is uh, our final hymn.
done by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The love of 